32 warm ups. Number one, when a ray of light goes from an air to a glass block, how does it bend? So it's going from a material that's not very dense to something that is more dense. So it's going to slow down a smaller speed, so it's going to have a smaller angle to the normal. Smaller speed in the thicker, denser glass, so you're going to make a smaller angle. The way that looks is here we have the glass block, here is the normal, here's the angle coming in, theta sub 1. It's going to bend so that the angle is smaller. There's theta sub 2. When light goes from a glass block to air, how does it bend? Okay, it's the opposite direction, so you expect the opposite thing. Going from glass to air, it's going to speed up. It's going to be a bigger speed, so you're going to make a bigger angle. So if I was to have the glass block here, and we have the normal. Here's the ray coming towards the boundary with a theta sub 1. We're going to make a bigger angle, so it's going to slant out that way. And there's theta 2, a bigger angle. Do not memorize left or right turns. Memorize bigger and smaller angles. We're going to skip three and four. Today's purpose. Anthony, please read today's purpose. I will learn how lens forms an image. We will read the following together and do examples. Relevance, Sam. Success, Lily. Okay, let's read this lesson together. Marissa, read paragraph number one, please. Number two. Um, let's see here, Casey. Okay, so um, right here we have nice flat surfaces that help us to see that if we have a normal here, we have the incoming angle and the refracting angle. And then we have another surface here with the normal and the other angles for that. This is approximating a nice smooth rounded lens like that just that we break it up into little pieces and approximate the curved with a flat surface. But either way, we can see that in this case, we have all of the um, parallel rays converging into one spot, coming together to be one spot. We're going to call that the focal point. And here we have, with these geometries, the rays end up spreading out or diverging and they appear to all spread out from this one spot. They don't actually come from that spot, but it appears that they do, and we call that a focal point as well. So we can have focal points on the right or the left, the front or the back of a lens. Next page, number three, Cherie. Brandon, number four.
Grant, number five. Okay, so converging lenses, relatively thick across their middle. So here we have a lens that's thick across the middle compared to the top and bottom. Relative to the top and bottom, it's thick in the middle. This one, even though it has a significantly different shape to it, it is thicker in the middle, middle relative to the top and the bottom. So those are converging lenses. We're going to have parallel rays coming in on one side, and they end up being focused in some way to one spot on the other side. Same thing with the other one. Uh, so we have parallel rays over here, and somehow they end up being focused in one spot on the other side. Diverging lenses. Diverging lenses. Uh, relatively thin across their middle. So here, this is obviously thinner in the middle relative to the top and bottom. This is not quite as obvious, but it's still thinner in the middle than on the top or at the bottom. Double convex, Christian. Okay, so please circle this term double convex lens and draw an arrow to one of these four that would qualify as that double convex lens. Which one did you draw to? Ricky, which one did you draw to? Oh, okay, I'll come back to you. Mr. Fry, not sure. Julian, one all the way on the right. This one right here? Okay, Ricky, we have a vote for this one being a double convex lens. Do you agree? It says here it bulges outwards on both sides. This is bending inwards. Outwards, one of the other three. Uh, Mr. Fry, the football looking one. In fact, that's how I'm going to describe it in your homework problems. Number seven, um, let's see here, not Austin, but Alex. Uh, <laughs> Circle the term double concave lens and draw an arrow to one of the figures up here that illustrate it. Grant, which one? Yep, the one far on the right. In fact, I'm going to describe it in your homework problems as an hourglass shape. This is called a double concave because both sides dip inwards. This is double convex because both bend outwards. This would not be a double convex. It'd be a concave convex or something along that lines. Here I have a lens that is a plano convex. On one side it's a plane, the other side it's bending out in the middle, so it'd be convex. Plano convex. This is actually a lens from a spy plane. Um, back in the 90s, spy satellites weren't quite as developed as they are now. We had spy satellites, but anyway, spy planes were a really big thing. And one of my students, their father worked for the company that made these lenses, and this was a factory reject. If this was made completely correct, um, it would have been top secret. But there were some imperfections on it, and so it was junk to them. Anyway, um, similar kind of a thing with spy satellites nowadays taking these big pictures. Okay, next, number eight, number eight. Patrick, read paragraph number eight. Stop! Circle! Focal point! Circle! Important thing! Go ahead, Patrick. Keep on reading.
Okay, next page. Paragraph 9. Isaiah. Every lens? Okay, circle of focal length right there. For thin lenses, we can simplify the situation by assuming that all refractions are at the vertical axis, this line that runs down the middle. Now, actually, in real life, when we have a ray of light coming in like this, there's going to be a little bit of bending at the first surface, and then a little more bending at the second surface, at the back surface, like that. It bends twice, once going in and once coming out. However, that geometry gets a little bit complicated. At this level of study, and even in the first couple years of college level study, we can have a very good approximation by just simply having it bend once at this vertical line called the vertical axis. The distance between the object way over here and the mirror is really big compared to the thickness of the mirror um, of the lens itself. Let me say that again. The distance from the object to the lens is a lot bigger than the distance across the lens. And so this little bit of an approximation here is not significant into the whole diagram thing. Okay, so here are the rules now for drawing ray diagrams. Uh, let's see here. Mr. Fry, please read the first rule, an incident ray. And Grant, read the italicized once. Marco, number two. Uh, a ray traveling through the focal point on the way to the lens will refract this lens and will travel parallel to the next to the lens. Grant, read the italicized. Don't you draw the refractive ray across the lens and the way. We don't need an incident ray to find the image and the object and the Okay, so think about number two here. Think about how you would draw that. Look at the diagram above to, to get the other parts. Think how that would look. Turning the page. Here are the two rays that you should have thought about as we read those rules. The first ray goes parallel to the axis and it bends down to the focal point and keeps on going. That was the first rule. That's an awful lot like the rule that we had for uh, of one of our mirrors, right? Parallel goes to the focal point. Okay, the second rule that you read that you should have thought about is going to look like this. It goes, um, let's see here, through the first focal point and it's going to refract or bend parallel. Once you draw those, we scribble out the incoming rays where the two refracted rays meet that is where the image is so location image image location okay let me hand out rulers and then we'll draw nice neat uh, diagrams for a couple examples here One, two, three, four, one, two, three, oh, one, two, let's uh, see here, Shree, give one over to Julian, one, two, need some more, need some more, where are my more rulers? Wow.
Okay, everybody have a straight edge. Okay, these example diagrams down here are not complete. So let's make them more complete. Let's extend the principal axis like this. You should all have inch rulers of one way or the other. Let's draw an object that is one inch tall. Let's draw an arrow that is one inch tall. It doesn't have to be exact, just that general idea. So this is your given information. You are given where the focal points are. You are given the lens. You are given the object. The directions are, draw a ray diagram to find the image. Okay, so from this, the very first step is to draw a ray that's parallel to the axis. My ray here just barely misses the lens. Let's pretend that it hits the lens at the very, very tippy top. Okay, don't get too picky on me. When it hits that vertical line, it's going to refract to go through the focal point on the other side. The light ray really truly is passing through the glass lens and it's really truly going downwards on the right hand side of the lens. Once I draw that refracted ray, I'm going to scribble out the incoming ray. Second step. Draw a line, a ray from the top of the object through the left-hand focal point. Remember, we have two focal points now. Got to keep them straight. So once it hits the, the lens, it's going to refract or bend. It's going to refract to be parallel to the axis. Once I draw that refracted ray, I'm going to crisscross out the incoming ray. Where the two refracted rays crisscross, that is the image location. The crisscross is below the axis, so that means that the image is going to be upside down. This image is made by the light rays really truly passing through that spot. So we'd call that a real image. It's upside down, so we'd call it inverted. I can measure it and I can see that it is less than an inch long. The object is an inch, so this is reduced. shrunk in other words. Notice that this follows the same rules as the images of the curved mirrors. Real images are always upside down. Real images um, are where the light rays crisscross. Um, now it doesn't follow the rule about the side of the uh, lens though with the uh, curved mirrors we had the real images on the same side as the object. That isn't followed here. Okay, now then, let's do another one where the image or the object is a lot closer to the lens. How is that going to change the image? Is it going to make it bigger or smaller? I'm going to make the same one inch tall arrow, but this time I'm going to make it a bit closer to the focal point here. Is that right? Oh, I think I screwed up with that. Ah, close. It's, it's close. So this is the given information. We are given the lens, we're given the two focal points, we're given the object. 
the directions are, find the image. So, the first step, draw a parallel ray to the lens. The difference here is that the ray is shorter, but it's the same height above the axis. It hits the mirror at the, si uh, the lens at the same spot, and then it goes down through the same focal point. That is pretty much all the same. Once I draw that refracted ray, crisscross out the incoming ray. The second ray goes from the top through the focal point to the mirror or lens. Okay, I don't have a big enough lens here, do I? Oh well, it still hits the vertical line. We'll just pretend that the lens continues down to where the ray is, all right? Use some imagination. Once it hits that vertical line, then it refracts to go parallel. Notice that because of the steepness here, it's going down way lower than before. So the crisscross happens way lower. The image is going to be way bigger. So we can see that this image is still a real image. It is still inverted, but it is now magnified. It is more than an inch. The object is one inch. The image is much more whoop, magnified, not magnitude. <coughs> okay, questions there? Anybody need more time to copy that down? We're going to skip the next one. Okay, for our diverging lens, we have slightly different rules. There is still a connection between parallelness and focal points, but it's a little bit different. Number one, any ray traveling parallel to the axis will refract through the lens and travel as if it came from the focal point. Let's draw that in the next one here. Again, we need to extend our axes here. And we're going to draw a one inch object. That is what's given to you. You are given the principal axis. You're given the hourglass shape of the lens. You are given the location and size of the object. The directions are draw a ray diagram to find the image. So the first step, as I just read, is to draw a parallel ray and it's going to diverge, it's going to go away from the principal axis as if it came from the focal point. So here is the ray going away from the focal point. I'm going to do dot, 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 dot. dot. See, it looks like it came from the focal point when it angles upwards like this. <coughs> That's the first rule. The second rule, oh, italicized. Grant, what's the italicized letters there? So I'm going to cross this off. Marissa, please read the second rule. And the italics, Grant. Okay, so here's the ray coming. It's going towards this focal point. Remember, this first ray used the left focal point. The second ray uses the second focal point. It's aiming towards that direction. The ray is going towards that right-hand focal point but the lens gets in the way and bends it in a different direction. It bends it so that it is parallel to the axis. Grant, once I draw this refracted ray, what else should I do to this incoming ray? I should cross it off. 
Okay, now these two refracted rays do not crisscross. But where do they appear to have crisscrossed? Well, this one appears to have come from here. This parallel ray appears to come from somewhere here. They appear to have crisscrossed right there, that spot. They didn't actually, but it appears that way. And so that is where our image is. That crisscross is above the axis, so our image is right side up. So we'd call that um, upright. It is definitely smaller than the object, and so it is reduced. Light rays do not truly pass through that spot. It's just in our imagination that they crisscross there, and so we'd call it a virtual image. Questions on that? How will this image change if we move the image or move the object up a bit? Let's find out. Here's my same one inch object, but now it's much closer to the focal point. Imagine how the red ray, the first red ray, is going to be drawn compared to the top one. How will it be the same? How will it be different? Think about it for a second and then draw it in. It's going to be pretty much exactly the same. The horizontal parallel part is slightly shorter, but it hits the lens in the same spot. It angles upwards at the same angle from the focal point. Not much changes there. Crisscross the incoming ray. Now think about the blue second ray. How is that going to be different? It's going to be different in at least two different ways. The first way is that it's going to be steeper. It's going to be a little bit shorter. Whoops, whoops. I drew the wrong thing. Let me erase that. The first ray that we drew relates to the left first focal point. The second ray that we draw relates to the second right hand focal point. Okay, my statement earlier stands though. The angle to, for this second ray is a little bit steeper than the angle previously. And it is shorter, of course, because we're closer to the lens. It's going to hit the lens slightly higher than before. The distance between the axis and this location of hitting is higher than up here. This then goes parallel. Once I draw the refracted ray, crisscross out the incoming ray. We ask ourselves, these do not actually cross, but where do they appear to have crossed? They appear to have traveled somewhere along there. This one appears to have traveled somewhere along here. And so this crisscross point right there is the image. Notice that's a little bit higher up from the axis than before. This is a higher distance, so we have a bigger, a bigger image. It is still upright, reduced, and virtual. Questions on that? Okay, next page. To figure out the locations of these images more precisely, we can use the same equation that we had for the mirrors. Fedoti. The F is the focal length. The DO is the object distance. The DI is the image distance, just like before. You can use any units you want, but they all have to be the same. We can measure these distances in centimeters, in inches, in meters, in millimeters, in nanometers, in miles. It does not matter, but you have to have the same one for all of them. A converging lens 
um, has different rules than the diverging lenses for positives and negatives. So to make things easier for you guys, we're going to have all of our math equations be converging lenses where everything is positive. With the diverging lenses, you have to worry about some things being positive and some are negative. So we're going to just skip those converging lenses 30 centimeters from the object. The image is found to be 15 centimeters from the lens. What is the focal length? So we're looking for the focal length. We're looking for the F. That stays a letter. The DO is the object distance. It says it's 30 centimeters from the object. So it's 1 over 30 next, plus 1 over 15. The image is 15 from the lens, so DI is 15. We turn each one of these into a decimal. 1 divided by 30 is 0 0.033. 1 over 15 is going to be 0 0.066. That is going to be 0 0.099, and that is not my final answer. That's 1 over the focal point. I want just plain old focal point. So I need to flip-flop the left, and I'll flip-flop the right as well. So 1 divided by 0 0.099 is going to get me 10. 10 centimeters. My other distances were centimeters, so this answer is in centimeters. Very similar to the problems that we've had in the past with the mirrors. So with that in mind, do number 17 with a converging lens, 60 centimeters and 30 centimeters. Find the focal length. Do that on your own right now. Take a peek at your neighbor when you're done and point out their mistakes. I get the answer of 20. Any questions there? The next one, we're looking for the image location. Which variable are you looking for in this case? DI. So you're going to have numbers for the F. You're going to have a number for the DO. You're going to have to do some algebra resmataz. Go ahead, do that right now. Turning them into decimals, 1 over 30 on the left-hand side is 0 0.033. 1 over 90 on the right-hand side is 0 
and then we have to add to that on the right hand side 1 over our di. So you're going to subtract off 0 0.011 from both sides and I get 0 0.022 and then I have to flip both sides over so I get 1 over 0 0.022. Final answer 45.45.45.45.45.45 in other words 45.5 Questions there? Okay. Number 19. We have a focal length of 415, so that's 1 over 415. The object is that far, so it's 1 over 652 plus 1 over di. 1 over 415 is going to be 0 0.0024. 1 over 652 is 0 0.0015 plus the fraction with our answer. Subtract off both sides, we get 0 0.0009 equals 1 over di. Flip everything over, 1 divided by 0 0.0009 is 1111. Did I do that right? That seems reasonable. A thousand is in the same realm as six hundred and four hundred. On the next page, we have a little reading as to how this refracting stuff goes on with uh, glasses and contacts. You can read that on your own. And then we have how microscopes do their thing. And some diagrams about telescopes. Some telescopes work with curved mirrors. Some work with curved lenses. This is the lens version known as a Newtonian telescope. And that's it. Tomorrow, tomorrow we have a lens lab where we'll have actual lenses and we'll figure out what their focal length is by focusing an image onto a little movie screen. On Schoology right now you have a homework assignment and you have, uh, see it's homework 132, and you have a wrap up as well I believe. You have the rest of the period to work on that. Ready, set, go. Thank you.